In this tutorial, we're going to talk about the flexural requirements for the slab in Visual Foundation. This example has a set of four piles supporting a foundation slab, and it has a downward uniform load. As you might expect, the top steel design of the slab will be important. So let's go ahead and move to the design view here to look at the foundation slab information. If we take a look at the design filter, we're currently showing shear unity values. The shear unity values involve one-way or beam type shear capacity calculations for the slab. Plate element shear forces are used in these calculations. If we take a look at the colors, they range anywhere from dark blue to green with a value of dark blue meaning zero for the unity value, green meaning one. And as you see, as we get closer to the piles, the shear unity value goes up. And I have flyby information turned on now, and we see we've got a shear unity value of about somewhere around 0.9 to 0.8, depending on where we're at. We see that over here in the project status panel as well, where the slab shear maximum is 0.96. Let's talk about the reinforcing steel now. Before we do that, I'm going to switch to the Modify tab and look at some of the parameters we use to set up reinforcing steel checks in Visual Foundation. Under General Checks, we have the ability to specify the particular specification we're using. We can specify that we want to use a high seismic load factors and overstrength factors if needed. F prime C currently is 4 KSI, and this is specified in the model and load view. We're not using lightweight concrete. Under the reinforcing area, we're currently using grade 60 steel. This slab happens to be 10 inches thick, so we're gonna use a double mat of reinforcement. We can also use a single mat if we would like. For our outermost bars, we're going to assume the bars running in the X direction are the outermost layer. We could switch that to Y if we need it. Same for the bottom layer. The outermost bars are in the X direction. We're using a 2-inch top cover, a 3-inch bottom cover, and all the results we're going to print out are going to be per foot width. And this per foot value is used in the steel demands as well as the shear demands. Another important entry here is the allowable rebar patterns. If I click on the dialog button, the following dialog appears. And, and you can see currently we're using bars anywhere from number three to number six at a 12 inch spacing. I can add to this group or remove bars from this group using this dialog. This is important when we look at the suggested steel because selected steel patterns are obtained from this list. For temperature and shrinkage, we have the ability to use the ACI provisions for temperature and shrinkage. We could also use wall provisions if we wanted. We could specify user ratios for minimum steel. And lastly, we could say that there is no minimum steel. Let's move to the design filter now and take a look at other values we can show. And we'll start with steel required. Switching this dialog now, we see we have a steel requir required color legend here out vertically, and it ranges from about 0.1 square inches per foot to about 0.43 square inches per foot, and we see that in colors as well. And you might look and say, well, nothing is showing in these locations around the piles. Why is that? That's because steel demand checks are not made at within the area of any supporting element, which would be the pile projected area in this case. Over here in the filter, we also have the ability to show which direction, and currently we're showing bars running in the Y or vertical direction, and we're showing them for the top layer, which is a critical layer for us because of the way this slab is bending. The steel required values are based on each individual finite element or plate in the model, so you see differing values for each plate. Let's now switch to the steel suggested value. 
And under Steel Suggested now, we see we have banded colors, where each band represents a given bar size and spacing. And we can see we have some areas where we have sixes at 12, some where we have fives at 12, and some where we have number threes or minimum steel at 12 inches. Notice that we're showing this pattern by plates. Currently, each finite element or plate in the model has its own color. We can switch that to something that might be more usable, for instance, by slab. When I switch to by slab, I'm going to get one color for the entire slab. And of course, red or sixes at 12 are going to be required if we're going to just use one bar pattern. Lastly, we're going to switch to by column lines. When we look at by column lines, we're going to see that we're going to take the model and each column line has forms a box. So for example, we're going from D.5 to E and running from 1 to 1.5, we have a box. And within that box then, we would need number 5s at 12. And as you can see then, in the center region, we're going to need the 6s at 12. This could be useful if you wanted to change the bar pattern layout across the foundation, say from 1 to 1.5 running vertically. I could use one pattern and from 1.5 to 4.5 I would use a different pattern and so on. The column lines A.5, D.5, 1.5 and 4.5 are column lines that I manually entered on the model and load view. So if you'd like to adjust the regions where you'd like differing bar patterns, you can do that on the model view. So this gives you a quick summary of how you look at flexure check values in Visual Foundation.